Welcome everyone who's logging on. We are going to give it a, about another minute so everyone can get settled, so welcome. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. We are waiting for people to log on and we will get started shortly. Uh, when you're logging on, if you're interested, please type in the chat, let us know where you're logging in from. Portlanders. <laughs> okay, we'll give it another couple of seconds. Okay. All right, I think we will get started. So uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Gail Mandel and I am the deputy director at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. I wanna warmly welcome everyone to this, site, this evening's program, Oregon Jewish Voices. The museum's mission is to explore the legacy of the Holocaust, Jewish experience in Oregon, teach the universal lessons of the Holocaust and provide opportunities for intercultural conversation. We challenge our visitors to resist indifference and discrimination and to envision a just and inclusive world. All of the museum's virtual programming, including tonight's event and recordings of past events are offered without charge. And we would be grateful for any donation you may be able to make to support our work. You can find information about donating and membership opportunities on our website. In case you aren't aware, I'm pleased to share that the museum is currently open. Wednesday through Saturdays from 11 a.m. until 4 p.m. In addition to our three core exhibitions about the Holocaust, discrimination and resistance in Oregon and the Oregon Jewish experience, our exhibition about Lawrence Halperin and his Portland Fountains continues through late November and Bonnie Meltzer's installation, Takun Alam, Mending the Social Fabric will be on view until late January. On December 12th, we will be opening the long awaited exhibition to bear witness extraordinary lives. Details about all exhibitions are available on our website. Tonight's event is just one of many on the museum's calendar, a sampling for events coming up in November. Thursday, November 4, we are offering a program ahead of his time, Richard Newberger, a conversation with Steve Forrester and Chet Orloff. On November 9, we will present Redignification Through Remembrance a program with Amanda Byron Singer, Associate Professor in Conflict Resolution at Portland State University, who will be Zooming live from Gerlitz, Germany, where she will be attending Jewish Remembrance Week, which includes the anniversary of Kristallnacht. And on November 11th, we will offer a multimedia conversation about Mahjong in American Jewish life with curator Melissa Martins Yaverbaum and Annalise Himes, author of Mahjong, a Chinese game and the making of modern American culture. Details for these and all of our programs are again available on our website. And once again, all of our virtual programming is available at, at no charge and we'd be grateful for any donation you may be able to make to the museum. And now turning to tonight's event, Oregon Jewish Voices owes its 22 year history to Willa Schneeberg, who has skillfully organized this event since its beginning. And we heartily and uh, ho heartily and provide her, offer our hearty and heartfelt appreciation for all of her work over the years. This evening, we'll be hearing from five writers, talented individuals whose work spans a range of genres, including fiction, poetry, essays, and song. We are grateful to them for giving their time and sharing their words with us. And while our writers won't be able to hear our appreciative applause, please know that you have them. In past years when we have gathered in person, our authors have been able to sell their books. So this year, if you wish to purchase a book or perhaps a CD of music, we hope that you will consider doing so and visit a local shop or check online. 
The format for this evening's event will be as follows. I will briefly introduce each writer who will then read for approximately 10 minutes. It is our hope that at the end, if there are any, that we will have time for questions. And if you do have a question, we ask that you please put it in the Q&A or in the chat, but we would prefer the Q&A. And with that, I would now like to introduce our first writer for the evening. Poet Joan Doby was born in Trogen, Switzerland of refugee parents and grew up in a small town in Northern New York. She teaches Hatha Yoga at the University of Oregon from which she holds an MFA in creative writing. Despite her many small press publications, several chapbooks and two full lengthly poetry co collections, her greatest claim to fame is that she was actually there and that's a capital T-H-E-R-E -E, there at Woodstock. Joan currently resides in Eugene and co-hosts the River Road Reading Series, a monthly reading series. Joan? Thank you. And um, I'm, I'm reading you from my bed because I have a COVID vaccine um, situation, but I'm comfy right here. I'm gonna read you three poems. One was written very recently. One was written 20 years ago and one was written almost 20 years before that. So they go in reverse um, order. First one, my growing up house, my growing up house. It was summer the day we arrived at that house. Somebody drove us there. We got out of a car and there we were. Pammy was sitting on the porch steps, four years old, half eaten sandwich in hand. She'd been waiting all day, knew we were coming, kids her own age, and we did come. We checked out the kitchen, small round table, but to us it was big. And in the living room, tall wooden chairs with numbers on them, donations from the town hall. Our dad, you see, was the new town doctor. He'd answered an ad. It had been, I believe, the old doctor's house, but he died and the town needed a doctor. And we, oh, how we needed a home. We were refugees, you know, from Vienna. Well, actually, by the time I was born, from Switzerland, or actually by the time we arrived there, from New York City. I was already almost four years old, a grand age to my mind, almost ready for school. Ellie was six and we had such fun exploring our new house, Pammy too. From the moment we stepped out of that car onto that porch, we were three. For the next decade almost, we were always three. And then came the babies, our own living doll, one for Ellie, one for me, none for Pammy, so we had to sort of share. Winters, we ate our meals in the kitchen. The roof leaked somehow into the ceiling lamp. It was really pretty, that lamp with its sparkle of water. We each had our own place at the table, Pammy too. And mom cooked lots of pasta, which we loved, and meat, of course, and then every fall there'd be strudel. She'd pick a basket full of apples off our backyard apple tree. I remember how she used to roll out that fragile thin dough on top of wax paper and then begin stretching it out around the entire kitchen table, thinner than skin, I swear, terrified it would harden or tear and her strudel would fail. She'd keep the kitchen doors shut tight to ward off the north country dry, north country air, and if any of us ever opened a door, she would scream and scream at whichever one of us might have ruined her strudel. She took her strudels very seriously, but her German, that language of theirs, oh, how she tried to throw that away. I have two children, she used to brag, meaning the younger two, who speak no German. Our parents lived in grateful fear. I've said this in another poem, which many people did not understand, but you do, I think. They were safe, more or less, in a country that touted acceptance, in a town where they were needed, in a house that in time became their own. Our dad worked very hard. He made house calls for $10 a shot. The phone rang every night. He held office hours twice a day at two and at seven. But on Thursdays, just once at two, on Thursdays, we went to a movie in the neighboring town. 
We couldn't go until after those afternoon office hours, which meant we always got there late. So we'd stay and watch the beginning after the end. To this day, I expect the beginning to happen after the end. Pammy lives in Canada now. Ellie still lives somewhere close by there. But me, I live far away. My friend Bruce once said about me, you appear to be rootless. But no, I have roots, North Country roots. Wherever I am, a ghost of me lives in that old childhood house with its damp, leaky walls and its cold, creaky floors and our mother's voice screaming, oh no, oh no, my strudel. The next poem is called Conversation Before Sleep for my mom, 1913 to 2002. She knew I'd be writing about it after she died. Are you taking notes? Her voice almost demanding. No, I said. Did you take your evening pills? No, she said. Do I have to? Yes. I think you should write a novel about my life. I've had a very interesting life. I've already written about your life. Besides, I'm a poet, not a novelist. Novels sell better. You need to write a novel. All right, I'll think about it, okay? You need to take your night pills. Do I have to take the yuck medicine? Yes. All right, if you say so, but it makes me sick. You'll be sicker if you don't take it. Anyhow, Barb says you need to take it. All right, if Barb says so, then I have to take it. You sure I have to take it? Yes, no. Okay, okay, I'll ask Barb tomorrow. Maybe you can stop taking it. Good, but do I still have to take it tonight? Yes. Okay, if you say so. I do everything I'm told. Will you get me a cigarette? No. Yes. Okay, okay, here. But you have to sit up to smoke it. You should start on that novel, you know, while you still have me around to answer questions. Maybe tomorrow, I have to think about it, okay? Okay, tomorrow. By the way, are you taking notes? And the next and last poem is called, My Mother is Alive. And the note that goes with it, this poem was written for my mother in 1984, when her life hung in the balance after a near fatal car crash. My mother is alive. Some poets write how their mothers are dead, who never really lived anyway, except behind the ironing board and in unfulfilled dreams. Not me, my mother is alive. Floating on her back in blue water, she is monumental as mountains on sky. Other mothers drift in white aprons, boneless as angels in pitiful retrospect. Not mine, mine is rock hard. Head on, two cars prove. She is full of bones and a good deal of brain, swollen, but thank God, undamaged. My mother sews like a factory, plays piano like an army, is a nurse like a doctor, a secretary like the boss, a lover of mushrooms, wild geese, and waterfall, a connoisseur of North Country snow. She can be a carpenter, a seamstress, a politician, my mother can knit an intricate sweater and read a book at the same time, write a book, design an Afghan, organize a peace march. At 72, she does Jane Fonda exercises to keep herself strong and nobody beats her in Scrabble. My mother speaks five languages fluently and Latin and Greek. In fall, she climbs trees to pick crab apples and bakes them into strudels and boils them into fruit soup or she's working in the doctor's office and the patients want her advice as well as his, or she's teaching German in the high school, or she's traveling to South America. Summers, she swims her favorite river to the island and back every day, the breaststroke, the crawl. She is slick as an otter on her back, dreaming under summer's blue dome, dreaming in the night under stars, dreaming this hard morning, on a different river. Today, my mother is hurt. She is drifting in a drugged stupor on a river of pain. Her high forehead is bloated like a rank summer melon and life tastes bitter in her mouth. She cannot eat. Under hospital sheets, 
My mother's body lies limp, pitiful as an angel. Her bones are all broken, eyes swollen shut. In her ears, the roaring like a waterfall, distant music of pain, strums electric against her overstressed nerves. In her teens in Vienna, she played the accordion, wrote verses to sing at weddings and parties. And all the boys liked her with her flashing green eyes. She smoked cigarettes with the best of them and danced into the night. My mother was no angel, but she knew how to live. And then Hitler came and all Vienna turned sour in her throat. All dreams became nightmare and the nightmare was no dream, but my mother lived. Crossed borders by batting her eyes at the guard, crawled under barbed wire. Death followed and roared and howled in her eardrums, but she clung to her spirit in the white dizzy Alps and though everything hurt, she lived. It's a family joke how when she was born all swollen and dark in her little white bed, an auntie condescending said, don't worry that she's ugly, maybe she'll be smart. They named her Angelica, Angel, and she was wild as Cochise in the movies, painted her face and called herself Quimbo the Indian. And only her guardian spirit kept her alive through a bone breaking childhood. But she was smart, hair death. And she kept faith in her guardian spirit, who kept faith in her. And as for you, hair death, this time in your car accident uniform, you hit her but missed her again. And this nightmare, which is no dream, also will end in her favor. Already the x-rays are changing their minds. Her broken bones are healing themselves in your face. My mother will swim again, walk again, command the piano. She will argue philosophy in five languages, slaughter us all at Scrabble and hold her grandson on her lap, whispering together as they do. And as soon as her eyes are open again, my mother will read this poem that I wrote for her. She will know in this world how much I respect her and love her and thank God and thank her and thank her true guardian spirit that my mother, my strong, unrepeatable mother is no angel. My mother is alive. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Our next reader this evening is Ellen Michelson. Novelist Ellen Michelson is a physician in Portland and an MFA graduate from Pacific University. Currently mm -hmm. an assistant professor of medicine at OHSU and vice president of the board of the Northwest Narrative Medicine Collaborative. She was an NEH fellow in medical humanities and attended Bread Loaf Writers Conference. Her work has appeared in Creative Nonfiction, Portland Monthly, Women in Solitude from SUNY Press and Literature and Medicine. The Care of Strangers, winner of the 2019 Miami Book Fair DeGroote Prize is her first book. Ellen? Thank you, thank you for, for having me here. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the Care of Strangers takes place in a big inner city hospital in the middle of Brooklyn, early 1980s. Um, Seema, the main character is uh, an orderly there. She's a Polish Jewish immigrant um, who aspires quietly to be a doctor, though her mother thinks she should really just be settled for, for being safe in America as a Jew. And the part that I'm gonna read is, is kind of in the middle of the book, um, an important uh, episode. Uh, Sima is helping Dr. Mindy Khan, an intern she's, be she's befriended, deliver bad news to a Ukrainian family. <clears throat> The Strom family huddled in the corridor outside the double doors to the CCU, a clan of people pacing and mumbling to each other, short and not so short, skinny and round, some with curly brown hair and some blonde, two or three wearing glasses and hats, the babushkas clutching purses to their chests. That was all Seema could see at first of these old country people Aunt Miriam left Poland to get away from. They sounded like an unruly school brood at recess. When she was little, the children of these people threw rotten tomatoes at her, spit at her, kike, dirty Jew. 
She pu didn't pull out her Star of David and wave it in their faces, but at that very moment, she wanted them to feel what she had seen in her own father's eyes when a Ukrainian doctor said <clears throat> he couldn't do anything for the son of a Jew and her baby brother died and her father was never the same again. Her mother couldn't figure, couldn't forgive her father and Seema's life was never the same again. A woman in an ankle length brown dress set a large bowl of potatoes and onions covered in plastic down on the floor. Immigrant families often brought foods, bowls of food that smelled of home. She elbowed the man standing next to, to a very old woman. Hold on to her, she said in Polish. I'm Dr. Khan, Mindy said. Does anyone in the family speak English? A little boy with a cowlick squirmed up close to Mindy. He reached into Mindy's jacket pocket. One of the babushkas grabbed him by the arm and yanked him away. Mindy folded her arms across her chest. We need a translator, she said. Seema here speaks their language, Nurse Armstrong said to Mindy. You're Polish, Mindy said. Ukrainian and Polish are similar, Mindy replied. She couldn't look at Mindy. She couldn't bear to look at, Ms. at Mrs. Strom or the rest of the family. The words are a little different, but we can understand each other. Nurse Armstrong led the family to the isolation room where they moved patients with contagious diseases, the only area with any privacy. There was a single bed with an unsheeted mattress, no pillow, and one chair at the far end away from the door. One family member huddled to the next. Seema scanned the clan. The room felt like a coffin. Mindy stationed herself against one wall. Her hands gripped the ends of the stethoscope hanging around her neck. Tell Mrs. Strom her husband had a very bad heart attack. Seema's first words came out too loud. She said in Polish, your husband had a bad heart attack. She wasn't a doctor, but she knew first do no harm. When Seema stopped talking, Mrs. Strom's mouth wrinkled into a hole. Bad heart, the woman in the long brown dress said in broken English. Seema noticed the embroidery down one sleeve of the dress, red and green <clears throat> with tiny threads of blue, hand sewn. Their eyes met for a long moment. Seema nodded to confirm. The daughter squeezed her mother's arm. She put a free hand up to her chest and struck it. Bad heart, the do daughter said, yeah. Tell her he had a heart attack at the other hospital, Mindy said. Nurse Armstrong pulled the chair out from the wall. Let Mrs. Strom sit down, she said. Seema said in Polish to the daughter, your mother should sit down. The sleeve of the daughter's dress brushed up alongside Seema's bare, weary arm. She leaned into the softness for a moment, caught the eye of the daughter. Then she moved closer to one side of Mrs. Strom, closer to the smell of boiled onion, and helped the daughter settle her mother the way she and Miss Armstrong had not been able to do with the old man in the CCU. Mindy bumped into the unmade bed, and the bed knocked against the wall. The sound of creaky metal wheels on hospital tile jolted everyone in the room. The daughter leaned in towards Seema. She said, tell me, please tell me about my father. Seema felt her own heartbeat quicken. Her own father, she could see his face. And then the cowlick boy stepped out. He grabbed hold of the finger of the rubber glove sticking from Mindy's pocket and pulled on it. Snap, snap, snap. Mindy stood there, a sullen face on. He shouldn't have, he should have stayed at that hospital in New Jersey. She said, why didn't he stay there? Miss Armstrong glared at Mindy. Dr. Khan was all she said. Seema yanked the glove out of Mindy's pocket and handed it to the boy. She said to the daughter, your heart's, father's heart was bad at the other hospital. First, do no harm. The child held the glove up to Mindy. Mrs. Strom and her daughter talked back and forth to each other. Mrs. Strom said, bad hospital, bad hospital. The daughter looked at Seema. She said, we were afraid there. No one spoke our language, no stay. Polish words came out of Seema's mouth and Ukrainian words came back at her. Papa this and Papa that. Papa the same in any language, back and forth. The farm words filled the air, Polish, Ukrainian, broken English. They want to see Mr. Mr. Strom, Seema said. And then she wanted to tell the daughter that Mindy had just lost her father too. It was a doctor's job to attend to strangers to put aside the pain of dead fathers and persecution for the moment and yet connect with it all at the same time. That's all they said, Mindy sank back into the bed. The boy put the glove up to his mouth and blew. Seema surveyed the scene. Mindy, the motley troop of family members standing quietly now, the old woman, 
the daughter, the boy breathing hard, the only room, sound in the room. Seema knelt beside the daughter on the floor by Mrs. Strom. They were two young women without fathers. Her own papa lost a six-year-old Seema long before he died. Something in Seema let the old country fall away. She looked up at Mindy, then back to the daughter. They were three, not Ukrainian, not Polish, not American. She said to the daughter, I too have lost my father. And then she said, the doctor lost her father. We understand. The boy continued blowing into the glove, the fingers stretching bigger and longer. Everyone in the room watched the boy's cheek puff out, cheeks puff out as he blew. He took another breath and then he lost his grip. The air inside the glove farted back into his face and the glove shot out of his hands. It shriveled to the floor. The boy laughed with his whole body. We gave him medication for his chest pain, Mindy blurted out over the laughter. The daughter reached for Mindy. Die, she said, Papa, die? Mindy nodded, her face a blank. The old woman raised her eyes to Seema, who was kneeling still alongside her daughter. She put her hand to Seema's face. Seema took the old woman's hand and held it in between her two hands. She nodded. She said, your husband has died. She nodded to the daughter, your father is dead. Mrs. Strum's head tilted back, her eyes closed. She leaned into her daughter who was standing by the side of the chair. May Pravda, this can't be. The old woman rocked back and forth in her seat. The chair shifted off center, threatening to tip. Mama, the doctor said. She put her arms around her mother, both of them wailing. Then the little boy began to cry. The daughter reached for the hand of the boy. She pulled him toward the chair and closed him in with her mother. The little boy's cries were muffled in the clothes of his elders. The other family members stepped in closer. Miss Armstrong leaned toward the old, the old woman. She smoothed the sweater bunched at the old widow's shoulders. Let's get her onto the bed, she said to Seema. Over her shoulder, Seema saw Mindy leaning back against the bed, her face, her face pale, the face of her mentor, her friend. She glanced at the family, the daughters holding her mother and the boy and up at Miss Armstrong. We can handle this, Seema said. Yes, Miss Armstrong said, I believe we can. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Our next reader tonight is essayist Daniel Pollock Pelsner. Daniel grew up in Portland and taught literature at the American School of Paris, Kahila Jewish High School in California, Harvard University, and most recently, Linfield College. He is currently a visiting scholar at Portland State University, the scholar in residence at the Portland Shakespeare Project, and the Shakespeare Scholar for the Oregon Psychiatric Physicians Association. His essays on theater and contemporary culture have appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, and The New York Times. Daniel last appeared on stage as Mordecai in Congregation Havara Shalom's Adults Only Purim Spiel. Daniel? Thanks so much, Gail. What a treat to be here tonight. And I, I'm thinking of the way that Joan has evoked for us her amazing mother. Um, I'm going to read another uh, a kind of tribute piece to a beloved elder, another Scrabble champion polyglot, and also, I guess, like Ellen's uh, uh, wonderful piece, uh, a tribute to somebody who had passed away and thinking about end-of-life rituals. So it's an essay I wrote for The Atlantic this March, and uh, there were a couple of things that were kind of going through my mind. One was that it was the the uh, one-year anniversary, the yard site of my um, of two actually grandmothers who had passed away in the last year and two years. And I was uh, teaching a Shabbat school class for my son's sixth grade about Jewish end-of-life rituals at Havra Shalom. I know we have some Havaronics in the group tonight who've gone through that Shabbat school teaching ritual. And so I was learning about um, saying the Kaddish and, and what that prayer meant and what it evoked. And it was also the one year anniversary of theaters shutting down across the country because of the pandemic. And so I was turning to other forms of entertainment and um, seeing lots of things on screens that had originated on stages. And one that I just happened to see that March was a 
uh, a film adaptation of this remarkable performance by Alicia Jo Rabins called A Kaddish for Bernie Madoff. And it was turned into an amazing film by uh, Alicia J. Rose. And I'd never seen it on stage. I didn't quite get what it was, but then I watched it and I was just blown away with it and, and realized it's a, a piece about loss. And it helped me think about the kinds of losses that um, we were experiencing as a bigger community and that I was reflecting on in my own life. So, um, so this is a, a, a 10 minute product placement for a Kaddish for Bernie Madoff. You should Google it. It'll, it's playing at film festivals across the country so you can find a screening online. And uh, it's a piece called uh, What a Kaddish for Bernie Madoff Taught Me About Mourning. Was it only a year ago when theaters around the country went dark, save for a lingering ghost light on stage? It feels more like 525,600 minutes, give or take a few, a period of ever accumulating loss with the odd glimmer of daylights and sunsets. I've been thinking about how we measure these elegiac anniversaries, in part because they line up with memories of loss in my own family. One of my beloved grandmothers, Yivi, died around this time two years ago. Another, Linda, died this time last year, fortunately, in a way, after a full life just before New York shut down. In Jewish tradition, we observe the anniversary of a loved one's death by saying the prayer of mourning, the Kaddish. The catch in socially distant COVID-19 times is that you're not supposed to say the Kaddish alone. It's a call and response prayer that requires a community to support you. And in fact, it's addressed to the community rather than God, even as it extols the divine power to bring peace. A Jewish community, a minion, requires at least 10 people to be present. How can we perform the rituals of mourning as a family, a congregation, a nation, when we still can't gather safely in person? Though rabbinic authorities have allowed remote workarounds for the Kaddish, I've taken heart from an extraordinary performance that reimagines the ritual, improbably titled A Kaddish for Bernie Madoff. It's the story of its creator, Alicia Jo Rabins, a poet and musician who secured an artist's residency on an empty floor of a Wall Street office building after the 2008 financial crash. She'd planned to work on a song cycle about biblical women called Girls in Trouble, but when she saw a picture of Madoff in the paper, she was transfixed. He looked like her dad. She became obsessed with the fraudulent investor and started to wonder what it meant that Madoff, so many of his victims, and she herself were all descendants of Eastern European Jews, how the sins of one member of a minority group seemed to reflect on the whole. He's pretty much the definition of bad for the Jews, she says in the piece. She'd heard rumors of a Florida congregation that said Kaddish for Madoff, as though he were dead to them. Rabins turned out to be only a degree or two removed from Madoff. Her mother had a college roommate who'd evaluated Madoff's credit. A friend knew a lawyer who represented some of his investors. Rabins interviewed her connections, a therapist whose parents had lost their savings, an FBI agent who had scoured Madoff's office, and set their recollections to folk rock cadences, composing a one-woman song cycle, playful and earnest in equal measure. There's nothing quite like seeing Rabins in a gray wig and pink pantsuit as Evelyn, the credit risk analyst, singing due diligence amid a flurry of flower petals. The show builds toward her own startling transcendent version of the Kaddish, along with a surprising recognition of the way we're all a little Madoffian in our quest for returns without loss, a world without failure, a line that goes up and up. Rabin's premiered Kaddish at Joe's Pub in New York City back in 2012, and then developed and toured it around the country for a few years, and now it's been made into a film directed by Alicia J. Rose. The two Alicias are both based in Portland, met after one received an email intended for the other. The film, uh, which is available on uh, all these film festivals online, is part docudrama, part first-person narrative, part Jewish feminist fantasy. Alicia Rose, who has a background directing music videos, surrounds Rabins with unexpected imagery. As Rabins explains Kabbalistic teachings about human interconnectedness, a chorus of synchronized swimmers paddles around her in the shape of a mandala that swirls 
somehow into an office coffee maker. If Anna Devere Smith, Sarah Koenig, and Joey Soloway wrote a self-reflexive musical about finance and religion, it might approach the film's impish mystical spirit. In Angels in America, one of Rabin's touchstones for an artwork in which ancient traditions illuminate everyday life, a secular Jew, the playwright Tony Kushner's stand-in, Lewis, is summoned to say Kaddish for Roy Cohn, that demonic prosecutor. Lewis can't remember the words. He confuses the Kaddish with the Kiddish, the prayer of a wine, until the ghost of Ethel Rosenberg, one of Cohn's victims, magically appears to prompt him. After the final Vimaru Amen, she adds, you son of a bitch. My grandma Yivi refused to see angels because of this scene. As a lifelong lefty who once joined a picket line outside her own father's kosher delicatessen, she thought Tony Kushner was reviving a McCarthyite scourge to mock a communist martyr. She might have had a case in an earlier scene when Cohn tricks Rosenberg into singing him a Yiddish lullaby, Tumbala, 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 Laika, which my grandma and my mother used to sing to me. But the Kaddish isn't ultimately a prayer for the dead. It's a reminder to the living to affirm unfathomable grandeur in the world and strive for peace on earth. Ethel Rosenberg is really blessing Lewis. You did fine, a nurse says when Lewis finishes saying the Kaddish. Fine, he answers. That was fucking miraculous. A sense of the miraculous infuses Alicia Jo Rabins's Kaddish as well. When she notices that Bernie Madoff has kind eyes, a picture of him tacked to her office wall quivers into hand-drawn life. Those eyes flicker and blink back at her. As Rabin's investigation concludes, a Buddhist monk, who also happens to be Jewish, tells her that Madoff represented the fantasy that we can control life's inevitable losses. The only transcendence is fully embracing the ups and downs, Rabin's chants over a plaintive violin. Though she was classically trained as a violinist, Rabin's also toured with a klezmer punk band. At the end of the film, she summons a minion of fellow artists, each holding a candle to witness her Kaddish for Madoff. Although the prayer is usually spoken, she starts to sing its Aramaic text, alternating major and minor thirds, life's up and downs. And then with an electronic pedal, she loops her voice, adding a new harmonic layer with each line. If you made it to the end of Pitch Perfect 3, you saw Anna Kendrick perform this same technique. It's a ritual of mourning that accrues beauty as it recurs, a technical illusion that, as Tony Kushner advised in his staging notes for Angels, lets the wires show. Watching this Kaddish on screen, I felt an acute sense of loss for the shared presence that film captures, for live performance in a physical space, for artists' livelihoods, for Bernie Madoff's victims, for COVID-19's death toll, for my Jewish immigrant forebears. But the resonant harmonies also gave me hope. Works of art can help us heal and transform from afar. Though my grandma's Judaism was more of the blocks and bagel variety, I think she would have relished Rabin's Kabbalistic approach. She also believed that we are all connected and that we have an obligation to care for one another especially the elderly, in the face of an economic system that rewards individual gain. Her pension, after a career as a special education teacher, allowed her to take me to see Fiddler on the Roof on Broadway. Had her savings been invested with Madoff, as several pension funds were, they might have vanished. At the end of her life, when she could hardly recognize anyone or put together a sentence, I would sing her tunes from the musicals we'd sing together. When I started singing, if I were a rich man, she squeezed my hand and murmured back, bitty bitty bum. Strictly speaking, I'm not expected to say Kaddish for my grandma because her own children, my dear mother and aunt are still alive. And yet I've said the prayer over Zoom, my unmuted voice out of sync with those of the other members of my reconstructionist congregation.
And as we wait for the vaccines to kick in, the economy to revive, the arts to come back, I feel the need to imagine other rituals of connection too. With a wig, a violin, and an electronic pedal, Rabins offers a way. She wrote to me that she doesn't feel a difference between performance and ritual, song and ceremony. I believe it's all one practice of facilitating healing, she said, catharsis, transformation, whatever we want to call it. I've been listening to her rendition of the Kaddish over and over, singing along with its circling harmonies, feeling a sense of release, letting the pain of loss go, and yet being called to repair it to refashion the broken pieces of the world into something sustaining. It's a blessing. Thank you. Thanks so much, Daniel. Our next reader for this evening is poet Willa Schneeberg. Willa is a poet, essayist, visual artist, curator, and psychotherapist in private practice. She has authored five poetry collections, including In the Margins of the World, recipient of the Oregon Book Award, and her latest volume, Rending the Garment. Willa co-founded OJMCHE with OJMCHE's director, Judy Margles, Oregon Jewish Voices, and guided a literary arts reader seminar entitled Literature of Modern and Contemporary Jewish American Women Writers. A new manuscript, The Naked Room, was a runner up for the Sally L. Biso Award. Willa? Delighted to be here and to see everyone. I mean, it's just such a, it's such a joy to be the 22nd year. <laughs> it's still happening. I guess I'm still alive. I want to particularly thank Judy Margles for all she has done to make this event possible and for her for emceeing for so many years. I want to thank Deputy Director Gail Mandel for emceeing this year and want to offer special thanks to Becca Biggs, Amber Curson, and Debbie Jane. Without their expertise, this event would not happen. I will read five poems and we'll start with a persona poem, a homage to Elijah McLean a 23-year-old Black man who died in 2019 after the police in Aurora, Colorado restrained him with a chokehold. Just last month, two years after his death, a Colorado grand jury indicted three police officers and two paramedics on charges, including manslaughter and criminally negligent homicide. Elijah played guitar and violin. This poem is in the voice of his violin. Elijah, elegy for Elijah McLean. One night, my gentle friend who carried me to many Petco's to pay La Bamba an ode to joy for all the lonely felines did not come home. He would cradle me on his left shoulder, his chin and cheek pressing against me, his whole body relaxing into me as he beheld my supple D string. I could hardly wait to be caressed by the slow, glide of his horse hair bow. I was told that men treated him harshly, wrapped an arm around him not to hug, but to choke. I'm sure they don't love first or second violins or know that one holds melody, the other harmony. If they did, they wouldn't have let him die. It is dark in my case. He is not here to cradle me. Music cannot escape. My sound holes are choked with stones. 
the next two poems I'm going to read are from my newest manuscript entitled The Naked Room, which consists of poems relating to mental health. Sleeping Beauty. In the basement where you now hide, a peck on the cheek will not rouse you. You imagine others tricked by sorrow, slumbering too, each in her own bed with blinds drawn, frost on their eyebrows. Above you, toilets flush yellow, tea kettles wheeze, daffodils happily wither in jelly jars. It seems only your windows have bars. The next poem is entitled Dream Session, and there's an abbreviation that you may not know. Uh, so I want you to, I want to explain it. The DSM stands for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, an essential tome for psychotherapists. Dream session. In this one, the panes in my apartment are small, don't open, and there is a refrigerator with a cubby hole wide enough for the DSM and a spigot for tears. You find the matzah and the jar of peanut butter, help yourself and say, you probably have another favorite client now. I spy you floating around outside my office suite. You never wear moo's. Stop it, stop knocking on every door but mine. After so many years together, you owe me a finale and applause, but instead you jumped ship. You just couldn't, you say, sorry, please accept this dream goodbye. With you, I almost erased my mother. If I ever turn myself inside out again, it won't be with you. You rub the crumbs off your mouth. Who knows? Without you, I might do the same old, same old. Pick up men whose fists shut me up and force me to change locks. I chose my final poems to acknowledge. I realize this is a real evening of celebrating mothers to acknowledge that this year is the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and the 20th anniversary of my mother's death. 9-11 was a tragedy for all, but I believe as a person born and bred in the Big Apple, I experienced it as a personal attack on my home. I will start with vapor. The epigraph reads, Mary Borders, 1973 to 2015. I just wanna tell you a little bit about Mary Borders. She worked for the Bank of America and was photographed by Stan Honda after the World Trade Center's second tower collapsed. She recovered from substance abuse in 2011 and died of stomach cancer four years later at the age of 42. Vapor. Knocked down on all four, she whimpers, I don't want to die. A photographer captures her as she stumbles to her feet. Coated in gray white soot, her black arms and hands look like white evening gloves. She wears a white mustache, a white bar across the bowl of her nose. Her nostrils are caked. The day of dust hangs her by a noose. Although the box is never kicked from underneath, she cannot flee, sure that Bin Laden will find her. 
smoking crack in her apartment in Bayonne. Bodies are in one piece, not fragments. The size of pinky nails or powder or vapor. And I'm going to end with uh, the poem about my mom, which is the same title as the book, Rending the Garment. Rending the Garment. The night before my mother goes into the ground, I try to eat in my hotel near Kennedy. But since September 11th, the restaurant is temporarily closed. In the still open souvenir shop, I find a t-shirt that fits me, a youth M, pre-shrunk, 10, 12, an I love New York t-shirt. I go up to my room. On the wall above my bed is a print of a colonial lower Manhattan. And outside my window is bumper to bumper traffic. My mother is a photograph, a horse voice on the answering machine, an Afghan of primary colored squares girded with black wool, a small coleus with pink spotted leaves outside apartment 306, a man in the street with a hole in his throat, a silver ring with a moonstone on my index finger. I pull the t-shirt over my head, claw at the red heart, but the fabric won't rip. I'm forced to use the small blade on my nail clipper to make a slit. Now my hands can tear the heart that hides the one that beats. Thank you. Thank you, Willa. Our final reader this evening is singer songwriter, Amy Shapiro. Amy was born in Madison, Wisconsin in 1952 and grew up in a reformed Jewish family. She currently lives in Portland with her husband, Jeffrey Oldnick. She is a Jewish music performer, songwriter, teacher, lay cantor and community activist. In June of 2021, Amy achieved her 30 year goal of getting the Oregon State Legislature to officially change offensive lyrics in Oregon State song, Oregon My Oregon, to her updated lyrics. The bill acknowledges Oregon's racist history and was passed by large majorities in both the House and the Senate. Amy? Thank you. I also want to mention that I wrote a melody for another song called Ve'ahavta, which is the official melody song at Havra Shalom. It goes, Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha bechol levavecha uvechol nafshecha uvechol mehodecha. And a lot of people might not know that I am the composer. They think it's a traditional old song. It's from the 80s and I wrote it. So I just, I'm proud of that. And I wanted you to know. Now this year I spoke to the Oregon State House of Representatives and Senate. I gave testimony in my quest to get some of the words to the Oregon State song, Oregon My Oregon Changed. And so I'm going to read to you my testimony that I said to the State Senate. It was in April, on April 28th of this year. And this is what I said to them in a Zoom meeting. Normally I would have been there at the Capitol speaking, but you know, things were different this time. So here's what I said, and I want to mention I used my middle name because I was very shocked to discover that there are other Amy Shapiros in the world. And I wanted to get credit for this after I'm gone. So here's my statement. My name is Amy Donna Shapiro. I have lived in Beaverton with my husband, family physician, Dr. Jeffrey Olnick since 1982. During that 38 years, I have worked as a music teacher and choir director and have done what I could to promote social justice, particularly through music. I have taught a lot of children to sing and I have sung for a lot of old people. Now I'm one of the old people and I'm hoping to leave a lasting positive legacy 
by changing the words of the Oregon State Song. I have a personal history with our state song, Oregon My Oregon. I first discovered the song and its inappropriate lyrics when I was asked to teach it to my children's choir, which was at the Portland Jewish Academy, for a statewide children's day back in 1990. I think that because I had lived for two years among the Ogallala Lakota Sioux Nation in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, I was especially put off by the racist lyrics that glorified the conquest and slaughter of Oregon's indigenous inhabitants. Years later, I was invited to sing the song with the Hillsborough Symphony Orchestra, and it was then that I began to write the new lyrics that we are proposing today. I have always been an advocate for social change. I worked for women's rights while living in Pine Ridge. I am proud to have been involved in the establishment of the Oregon Holocaust Memorial in Washington Park. In fact, I was on the board of directors of the Oregon Holocaust Resource Center, which is what it was called back then. And I sang at almost every Yom HaShoah commemoration in Yiddish and was thus friends with almost every Holocaust survivor who lived in Portland, greatly honored. I was, um, I was, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was involved in the establishment of the Oregon Holocaust Memorial in Washington Park, and I sang at its dedication. And I am the author and composer of one of the official songs of Madison, Wisconsin, where I was born. I have been working with the Oregon legislature since 2016, reaching out first to Senator Mark Hass, then working with Representative Tobias Reed, and since 2017 with my representative, Sherry Scouton. A few years ago, Sherry introduced me to tech savvy, tech savvy Evelyn Kocher and the Facebook page Change the Oregon State Song was created. Now I think that maybe we should have called the page Save the Oregon State Song because that is what we are truly doing, preserving our historic state song. The changes we have proposed are small, but they are profound outdated, misleading, and offensive words glorifying oppression and murder are replaced with inspiring words glorifying Oregon's natural beauty, majestic mountains, forests, and rivers, as well as our love of freedom. Oregon's artistic community has welcomed these changes. Dr. Paul Clemmy, director of the Willamette Master Chorus in Salem, is looking forward to performing and recording Oregon My Oregon with the new lyrics. And a virtual recording of the song is planned for next month, which in this case was May and it happened, with me singing the new revised lyrics with the Hillsborough Symphony Orchestra. Many people in Oregon are surprised to learn that we even have a state song since it is so rarely sung. I want to sing it. I want you to sing it with me. I want school children and community choirs to sing it. I want everyone to be proud to sing it. By making a few updates to the lyrics, we can make that happen and we can make history. Please pass HCR 11 to save our state song, Oregon, my Oregon. Thank you. And they did. So after the, this, uh, I've just been waiting to see what would happen. The governor has not yet acknowledged that this has happened. I know she's busy with COVID, so I don't know what's gonna happen. I want it to be in the schools. Anyway, Paul Clemmy, the director of the um, Willamette Master Course is in fact making a recording. This week, they're working on it. It's for their annual veterans concert and they're doing it virtually this year. And he asked me to make a one minute video introducing the song. I'm not singing in with the choir, but I'm going to be in the video introducing the song. So this is what I wrote. It takes one minute. Hello, my name is Amy Shapiro, and I updated the words to the Oregon State song. I worked for years with Representative Sherry Scouten, and this year, the Oregon House and Senate both passed her bill acknowledging the song's racist history and making my new words official. Now Oregonians who grew up singing and loving Oregon, my Oregon can sing it again with pride as it better represents our state today. I'm honored and grateful that Dr. Paul Clemmy asked me to participate in this video presentation of the Willamette Master Chorus's new arrangement and performance of Oregon, my Oregon with the new lyrics. 
I'm so happy and excited that they love my updated version of the song. I hope that you do too, and that we will all be learning and singing it together soon. So now I'll sing it to you. I'll tell you the words that I did not like were the original words of the first two lines, which were land of the empire builders, land of the golden west, conquered and held by free men, fairest and the best. And then nowhere in the song did it talk about mountains, rivers, or forests. But in the second verse, it said that we were blessed by the blood of martyrs. And I did not appreciate that. I didn't want to teach it to children. I didn't want to sing it. I didn't want anybody to have to sing it. So I changed it to blessed by the love of freedom. So all in all, I only changed officially approximately eight words, although I changed the whole, changed the whole first two lines of the song. And here is the new song. So I hope you will enjoy it and sing it if you can. Land of majestic mountains, land of the great northwest, forests and rolling rivers, grandest and the best, onward and upward ever, forward and on ever. Land of the rose and sunshine, land of the summer's breeze. Laden with health and vigor, fresh from the western seas. Blessed by the love of freedom, land of the setting sun. Hail to the land of promise my Oregon. Hail to the land of promise, my Oregon. So there it is. And if I have one more minute, I just want to tell you that I also wrote an article back in 1992 that was published in the Pockentrager, which is from the Yiddish Book Center in Massachusetts. It's a full page article about our trip to Birobijan, which is the former capital of the Jewish Autonomous Region. And I'm just going to read you one paragraph of what I wrote here. This is about Yiddish being an official language in Birobijan, and we went there to perform in a festival. And I wrote, still the language is fighting an uphill battle. Having lived for two years on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, Jeff and I couldn't help being struck by certain similarities between the two places. Both Pine Ridge and Birobijan share a lifestyle determined by poverty, by long-term neglect and broken promises of a distant and powerful government bureaucracy. Both share a recent history of oppression during which an entire generation was deprived of their religion and their language. In both cases, the old people remember the language, the songs, the traditions, while the next generation tries to reclaim for their children that which they were denied. Both places won our hearts. The warmth and humor of the people keep hope alive. So I am a singer, I'm a songwriter, but I'm also just a plain old writer. And I really appreciate you inviting me to be here today. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, so we have just a teeny bit of time. Um, we do have uh, one question. Um, actually, Amy, if you could clarify, because it's it's for you. Um, when you said that the governor had signed, has she did the governor not sign the bill yet? It was passed, but she has yet to sign it. And oh, sorry, she didn't have to sign it. Oh, okay. It is an okay. official bill. It was passed by the House and, a, and the Senate, and it went okay. to the Secretary of State, who made it official. But I just, I'm wishing that Governor Brown would 
recognize Sherry Scouten and myself for the work that we did and maybe talk about getting it into the school so that it can spread around. There are a lot of people who used to love to sing the song until they realized what the words said and then they stopped singing it and now they want to sing it again, but you know, we have to get the word out. Okay, all right, thank you for that. You're welcome. Well, with that, um, some concluding remarks. Thank you again to all of, all of the our five fabulous writers this evening. It was wonderful to hear your words and thank you to everyone who logged on to join us. Uh, one quick reminder, if you do wish to purchase a book or more than one book or perhaps some music, please visit a local bookstore or shop online. And if you have any trouble finding the title that you're interested in locating, please reach out to the museum and we'll do our best to help you. And it's been a pleasure spending this time with you all. And I wish you all a good night and a good rest of the week. Take care, be well.